Ramakrishna's teaching on God. You see many stars at night, up in the night sky, but you don't find them when the sun rises. Can you say that there are no stars in the heavens of day? Because you behold not God in the days of your ignorance, you say that there is no God. But God is without attributes, unchangeable, immovable, firm like a mountain. His name, if anything, is intelligence, his abode, intelligence. And he, as God is, all intelligence. God cannot be described or explained in words. As a man, if he were called upon to give an idea of the ocean to a person who had never seen it, they would only be able to say, Sir, it is a vast sheet of water, a big, big expanse of water. It is water all around. So, one who has realized the infinity of God can only say, God is everywhere. Furthermore, there is no distinction between impersonal God on the one hand and a personal God on the other. When the Supreme Being is thought of as inactive, he is styled as the Absolute, Brahman. And when he is thought of as active or creating, sustaining, and destroying, he is styled as Shakti or the Personal God. God is Absolute eternal Brahman, as well as the father of the universe. The invisible God, pure existence, intelligence, and bliss is like a vast existence, a vast shoreless ocean without bounds or limits in which I only struggle and sink. But when I approach the ever-supportive personal deity, the personal God, I get peace like the sinking man who finds the shore. At one time I am clothed, at another time I am naked. So God is at one time with attributes and at another time without attributes. Shiva and Shakti, the Absolute and the Creator, are both necessary for creation. With dry clay, no potter can make a vessel. Water is necessary. So Shiva alone cannot create without Shakti, or force. God is formless, and God is with form too, and he is that which transcends both form and formlessness. He alone can say what he is. God with form is visible, and we can touch him, as one can shake the hand of a dearest friend. The idea of God with form and without form, they're like ice and water. When water freezes into ice, it has form. When the same ice is melted into water, all form is lost. God with form and God without form are not two different things, not two different beings. He who is with form is also without form. To a devotee, God manifests himself in various forms. Just think of a shoreless ocean, an infinite expanse of water, no land visible in any direction. Only here and there are visible blocks of ice formed by intense cold. Similarly, under the cooling influence, so to say, of the deep devotion of his worshipper, the infinite reduces himself into the finite and appears before him as a being with form. 
again as on the appearance of the sun, the ice melts away, so on the appearance of knowledge, God with form melts away into the formless. As the same fish is cooked or dressed into soup or curry or cutlet, and each has its own choice dish of it, so the Lord of the universe, though one, manifests himself differently according to the different likings of his worshippers, and each one of these has his own view of God, which he values most. To some he is a kind master or a loving father, a sweet, smiling mother, or a devoted friend, and to others yet God is a faithful husband or a dutiful and obliging son. Fire itself has no definite shape, but in glowing embers it assumes certain forms. The formless fire is then endowed with forms. Similarly, the formless God sometimes invests himself with definite forms. So long as the sound of a bell is audible, it exists in the region of form. But when it is no longer heard, it has become formless. Similarly, God is both with form and without. But God's aspects are many. God is one, but many are his aspects. As one master of a house appears in various aspects, the man of the house being father to one person, brother to another, husband to a third, and so on, so God is described and called in various ways according to the particular aspect in which he appears to a particular worshiper. The sun is many times bigger than the earth, but distance makes it look like a very small disk. Likewise, the Lord, God, is infinitely great, but being too far away from him, we fail to comprehend his real greatness. The sun lights up the earth, but a small cloud will hide it from our view. Similarly, the insignificant veil of illusion prevents us from seeing the omnipresent and all-witnessing existence of infinite God. This illusion is like the weeds floating on a pond. You can push away the weeds, but presently the cleared space will fill in again. Similarly, so long as you reason within yourself and associate with holy men, everything seems clear. But shortly afterwards, worldly desires will throw over you this veil of illusion. Illusion is of two kinds, one leading towards God and the other leading away from God. The former consists of discrimination and non-attachment. With the help of these, the individual souls surrender themselves to the mercy of God. The ignorant side of illusion consists of lust, anger, avarice, inordinate attachment, pride, and envy. This kind of illusion gives rise to the sense of me and mine. It serves to keep men chained to the world. But as soon as the illusion manifests herself, and the illusion is known as illusion, all knowledge destroys illusion. How to realize God? What offering is required to attain God? To find God you must offer him your body, mind, and riches even your money. By what kind of work can God be attained? There is no difference in work. Do not think that one kind of work will lead to God and the other will not. Everything depends upon His grace. To have His grace, whatever work you perform, do it with sincerity and earnest longing. Through His grace, environment will be favorable and the conditions of realization will become perfect. If you want to renounce the world and your family depends upon you, perhaps your brother will assume its responsibility for you. Perhaps your wife will not hinder you at all in your spiritual life, but rather help you. Or perhaps you will not marry at all, 
and will not be attached to the world in any way. You get what you seek. He who seeks God gets him. He who seeks for wealth or power gets that. Truthfully, I say to you that he who wants God finds God. Go and verify it in your own life. Try it for three days. You're sure to succeed. In this age of corruption, even three days are enough to make a man perfect. You will see God if your love for him is as strong as the attachment of the worldly-minded person is to loving the things of the world. Standing beside a pool covered with weeds and scum, one would say there was no water in it. To see the water, one must remove the scum from the surface of the pond. Even so, with eyes covered over with the film of illusion, you complain that you cannot see God. If you would see him, you would first put away the film of Maya from your eyes. As the rosy dawn comes before the rising sun, so is a longing and a yearning heart the forerunner of the glorious vision of God. The kind of man whose hairs of his body stand on end at the bare mention of God, he who sheds tears of love on hearing the names of God, he is already the kind of man who has taken his last birth. There are several signs of the attainment of God. There is no delay for him in attaining God with whom the glories of affection are becoming manifest. What are the glories of affection? Discrimination, dispassion, tenderness to all life, service to the good, and love of their company, recounting of God's name and glory, truthfulness, all of these. Some people are already awake. These have certain marks. Usually they do not care to hear or speak of anything except matters relating to God. Some are already awake. These have certain marks. For one thing, they do not care to hear or speak about anything except matters relating to God. On the power of thought, Ramakrishna taught that the mind is everything. If the mind loses its liberty, you lose yours. If the mind is free, you are free too. The mind may be dipped in any color, like a white cloth fresh from the wash, Study English, and you must mix English words in your talk. These scholars who study Sanskrit must quote Sanskrit verses. If the mind be kept in bad company, it will color one's thought and conversation. Placed in the midst of devotees, it shall meditate upon God and God alone. It changes its nature according to the things amongst which it lives and acts. The mind is everything. The attraction for the wife is of one kind, and the affection for the child is of quite a different nature. On one side is one's wife, on another side is the child. One caresses both, but moved by quite different impulses. Any bondage is of the mind. Freedom also is of the mind. If you say to yourself, I am a free soul. I am the Son of God. Who can bind me? Well, free you will be. If one is bitten by a snake and can say with all the force and will of faith, there is no venom, there is no venom, you will probably get rid of the venom. One becomes as one thinks. They say that by constantly thinking of a particular kind of insect, a cockroach itself is transformed into that insect. Similarly, he who constantly thinks of the bliss absolute becomes himself full of bliss. Many with a show of humility say, I am like a low worm, groveling in the dust, thus always thinking themselves worms. In time, they become weak, weak in spirit like worms. Let not despondency ever enter into your heart. Despair is the great enemy of progress on your path. As a man thinks, so he becomes. He who thinks that he is a free soul is verily a free soul. 
he who considers himself God verily becomes God. As one thinks, so one becomes in time. On spiritual practice, Ramakrishna taught, as the same sugar may be made into various figures of birds, cubes, or even beasts, so one sweet divine mother is worshipped in various climes and different ages under various names and forms. Different creeds are but different paths to reach her. As various ornaments, having different forms and names, are made out of the same metal, so in different ages and countries, under different names and forms, one god is worshipped. However, various the fashions of his worship. Some love to call him father and others mother, yet it is one god who is worshipped under so many names. Our duty is to fall down and adore where others only bow. The light of the gas lamp illumines different parts of the city with varying intensity, but all the lamps receive their supply of gas from one common source. Similarly, the religious teachers of all countries and races receive their inspiration from one almighty source. And as one can ascend to the roof of a house by means of a ladder or a bamboo or a staircase or a rope, in various other ways, so diverse are the ways and means to approach God. Every religion in the world is one of the ways to reach him. Whoever performs devotional exercises with belief that there is but one God is bound to attain him, no matter in what aspect, name, or manner he is worshipped. Different creeds are but different paths to reach the Almighty. Diverse are the means by which this temple may be reached. Some come here in boats, some in carriages, some on foot. Similarly, different people may attain God by following different religions. A mother loves all her children equally, but she so arranges the food for them that everyone gets what they need. Similarly, the Lord has provided different forms of worship to suit different men with different capacities and in different stages of spiritual development. A common man, through ignorance, considers his own religion to be the absolute best and makes much useless clamor. But when his mind is illumined by full and true knowledge, all sectarian quarreling disappears. You will advance in whatever way you may meditate upon him. No matter how you eat the cake, it tastes equally sweet. <laughs>